Hi everyone and welcome to the SVRP webinar number two. We're just going to be getting started in a few minutes time. We're just going to give uh, a little bit longer for some more people to join. Um, so just bear with us in a couple of minutes time. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Small Vessel Replacement Programme and um, Public Engagement Webinar number two. Uh, my name is Jim Anderson. Uh, I'm sure a few people who are tuning in tonight might uh, know who I am. Uh, I'm the Director of Vessels at CMAL, and behind the scenes tonight, uh, we've got representatives from CMAL, from Transport Scotland, and from CalMac Ferries. Next slide, please. OK, um, so thank you once again for joining uh, the webinar for the Small Vessel Replacement Programme. The webinar will last approximately one hour, 30 minutes, with time for Q&A within the session. Uh, we ask you that you please visit our dedicated project page for the Small Vessel Replacement Programme at the normal place, www.cmassets.co.uk forward slash project forward slash SPRP. There will be a recording and a PDF copy of this presentation. It uh, will be made available on our website and on our YouTube channel. And we hope to do that within the next few days, all being well. So if we don't get it for Friday, certainly we'll get it uh, by early next week. Uh, please take a note that uh, this presentation is being recorded. And a Q&A document with all the questions asked at the, the webinar will be available on the CMAL website, and we hope to publish that within the next three to four weeks. Next slide, please. The Q&A session will take place uh, at the end of the presentation and will be conducted by Brian Fulton, Head of Business Support at CMAL. Please type your questions into the chat box on the right hand side of Teams throughout the presentation and if you just have a look there and see the image to your right. It is optional whether you use your name or post as anonymous. Any questions not answered during the session will be added to our Q&A document, which will be uploaded onto the project page on the CMAL website project page. If you have any further questions tonight, following tonight's webinar, please email us at Small Vessel Replacement Programme, SVRP, at cmassets.co.uk. And thank you for all your time and for your questions in advance. I'm now shortly going to hand over to Lewis Hamill, who will be going through the presentation. Uh, just quickly before we go there, this is, as, as we've said earlier, the second in the this live webinars. What we will be doing, uh, and that being Q2, we will be actually organising face-to-face uh, follow-up um, uh, consultations with, with the public. So we'll be looking to announce that at some point in Q2. So thank you very much. And now we'll hand over to Lewis. 
Thank you, Jim. I'm just get the slide. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Lewis, as Jim said, and um, carried out the presentation that we've done for webinar number one. Uh, I'm a technical superintendent here at CML and been involved in the small vessel uh, replacement program. So first of all, I'm just going to start by giving an overview of what we covered in the first webinar, and then we'll move on to the updates that we have on the SVRP. So just to give you an idea of all the topics we covered, um, it has been quite a bit of time since August. We had planned to carry out this webinar prior to Christmas, but just with um, the priorities that we had ongoing, uh, we had to move it into the start of this year. Uh, so hopefully now we can give you a, a good update on the small vessel replacement programme. So what did we cover at the first webinar? Well, we covered um, the, the programme itself, talking about the background of it, the reasons for it, the kind of key drivers, which is emission reduction uh, and the programme phases. We covered the, the kind of workings of the working group and the reference group that we have set up for the programme. Um, a bit on the in-scope routes and how that developed uh, into the deployment plan uh, in-scope routes. The vessel concept design and feasibility studies, which included information on the vessel and service requirements, the vessel design variants, um, things like the passenger capacity, the spaces and facilities, along with accessibility. We then also covered as part of the vessel design, vehicle deck layout and capacities, the crew levels and areas, and then as well as that, the machinery options, such as the propulsor options and the propulsion machinery concepts. Alongside the vessel studies, we also gave some information on the port feasibility studies um, and what port enabling works would be required for the potential new vessels and as well as that the shore power works and finally to finish off we gave a kind of an overview on our thoughts at the time on the deployment plan and the planning dates for the program so tonight we will plan to give an update on all of this just to give you an idea, so as Jim said, we have a Q&A document. Uh, some of you may have seen that. It's on our website, which includes all the questions from the first webinar. So at the, the August webinar, we received over 70 questions and, and currently got 71 on the Q&A document. Any questions we do receive tonight, any that are then sent into the mailbox following tonight, will be added to the Q&A document. So it will, it will just be a continuous document through the lifetime of the programme. Um, the pie chart on the right here, you can see the breakdown of the, the types of questions that were asked. And as you can see, the vast majority of questions were on the vessel design and the feasibility studies. Um, and as Jim had mentioned, you can find that Q&A document on our project page. So for tonight's webinar, we're going to first of all cover the vessel design variants that we're going to give an update on that. Then a bit more detail on the design features of the vessel. We'll provide an update on the deployment plan and the in-scope routes uh, and then for those routes uh, an update on the shore power and any port enabling works that might be required for these new vessels. We will then provide an update on the kind of planning dates and the next steps as Jim mentioned about uh, the next steps for engagement but we'll also give a, an update on uh, vessel deliveries etc and then we'll have time for the Q&A session at the end of this presentation. So first of all, moving on to the vessel design variants. So this is just to give you a reminder of what was presented at the first webinar. Um, as you can see, we had the three uh, design variants. We had design A, B and C, and these were differentiated by their capacities, mainly their vehicle capacities. So it was proposed that all vessels would have the same passenger capacity of 150, but would have different car capacities. So 25 for design A, 15 for design B, and 32 for design C. As you can see from the, the, right, the table on the right hand side, all design variants were similar apart from the vessel's beam. Um, and this basically differentiated for the different capacities. So for example, design A would have three car lanes for the 25 cars, design B two car lanes for the 15, and design C the 30, sorry, four car lanes for 32 cars. And that just gives you a comparison with the hybrid vessels that we have in the fleet and then the kind of more typical lock class vessels such as the lock ridden, the lock rands or these types of vessels. We did let everyone make everyone aware that design C was for the work that we're doing with the Highland Council, but that that has been checked against the Chiffs routes uh, for the Calmac routes and has been identified that it won't be required for the first phase but it has been investigated as part of the second phase, but we'll have more on the two different phases uh, at the end of the presentation. 
Um, now to provide an update of where we are at the design variance and particularly on the passenger capacities. So at the last webinar, um, we did receive a, quite a few questions um, on the 150 passenger capacity and the fact that that might not be suitable for all of the in-scope routes for the small vessel replacement programme. Um, we've also received questions at the likes of our reference group on this as well. Um, this was mainly regarding two routes, uh, which is Largs Cumbria and Iona Finnefort. Now we're going to touch on Largs Cumbria a little bit later in the presentation, but first of all, I'm going to speak about Iona Finnefort. So we have taken those, those comments and questions on board and we have looked at an alternative design B, which we are calling design B Max. Um, and this would be a vessel capable of carrying 15 cars and 250 passengers. Okay, so an increase from the previous 150. Now, um, this would mean that design B would actually be the same main particulars. So the same length, beam and draft as design A, i.e. the same hull form, but would have a different superstructure arrangement and a, and a different vehicle deck layout. So if I take you to the table on the right hand side, um, you can see the difference between Design A, Design B and Design B Max. So this is the latest main particulars with an update to the overall length, um, which is just short of the 50 metres that we'd stated before. The rule length, otherwise known as the waterline length, is, the 40, is still 46.2. And as you'll see there, Design B Max is the same beam as Design A. Um, the design draft and the maximum draft, so maximum draft of 2.14, but a design draft that we're looking at of 2.1. Um, that would be the same for all design variants as with the design speed. And then this is where the designs differ. So A and B would be 150, but design B match would be 250. And the, uh, the car capacity, also known as PCUs, uh, is now we're now seeing 24 stroke 25 for design A. The reason for that I'll touch on in a second when we show some layouts of the vessel is just an update to the evacuation uh, proposals for the vessel. Um, and in Design B and Design B Max would have the same car capacity. Uh, for HGVs, Design A would, would be capable of taking two as it was previously, and Design B Max would be the same as Design B. Now, our proposal is that Design B Max would replace Design B. Uh, so B Max uh, is called that for this time being, just to differentiate between the two but we would, going forward, just start to call this Design B. So just now to touch on some of the vessel design features, which are the same for both Design A and Design B Max. First of all, to talk about the propulsion concept. So if you maybe remember back to the first webinar, we presented that we'd investigated four different propulsion concepts the four being uh, diesel, um, as we've got for the current vessels, which was mainly for reference. As you know, our main goal of this programme is to reduce emissions, and particular zero emission operation. Uh, the second uh, concept we investigated was a hybrid solution in line with our existing hybrid vessels. And then we looked at two fully electric zero emission concepts. The first one would be to have a backup generator built into the ship and the second one would be to have a backup generator which was housed ashore. Now our preference at that stage was to go for the one with the built-in backup generator and this is just because it adds a bit more resilience. It's already built into the ship when we have to extend the capacity, the capacity of the vessel for getting to say dry dock um, or potentially an extended uh, sailing day which might occur. So that is still a preference to go down the route of this option. So to have fully electric zero emission vessel using lithium ion batteries. Now the chemistry is still to be confirmed. Uh, that will likely be confirmed during the tender phase and the procurement phase. Um, and we will have, have the built in backup diesel generator. So that means the vessel will be equipped with five megawatt hours approximately. Um, that will depend on final chemistry and final battery supplier. Uh, We'll split these into four of 1.25 megawatt hours, and I'll show you a layout of the proposed battery rooms in a second. Um, we touched on the last time about the potential of having four propulsors, which we'll touch on more in the following slide. So that's approximately 187 kilowatts per propulsor, which is about 750 in total, which is the same as the existing hybrid vessels. 
Um, the backup generator would be approximately 374 kilowatts, and then we would have the 1000 amp show supply connections for connecting overnight to charge the batteries. Um, for the propulsors, we would also look to have premium efficiency electric motors, and depending on final propulsor choice, a lot of these now come as built in, which makes them more efficient. Um, so as I've touched on there, the vessel will operate all day utilising the batteries and will charge overnight when tied up in port. And the battery capacity has been sized to cope with the longest possible sailing day out of all of the routes. So um, it can cope with the most demanding day. But we do have the diesel generator there uh, to use in the case of emergencies and extending the range. The little diagram here you can see on the right hand side is a very simplified single line diagram just showing the arrangement of the batteries, the four propulsors which are labelled as M, uh, sorry, <laughs> labels propulsors with the motors labelled as M, um, and then how that connects to the shore power, uh, the backup generator and the consumers for the vessel. So to touch on the batteries themselves uh, is going to be a key part of this, um, it is obviously the main way of uh, propelling the vessel. So our proposal is to have two battery compartments, so one on the forward part of the vessel and one in the aft part. And as you can see from the diagram, this would be separated by what we're calling the service aggregate room, which is where the backup diesel generator would be located. And we would also have the switchboard room separated as well. This means we have complete redundancy in the ship so that if we were to lose one part of the ship in terms of a uh, forward battery room, for example, we still have the aft uh, part to power the ship. This means that we also don't have to provide an emergency generator on board the vessel as we do in our current uh, existing small vessel fleet. So there'll be no emergency generator on board. Um, so we would split the batteries equally between the two. So each battery compartment would have approximately two and a half megawatt hours or 2,500 kilowatt hours of batteries. And again, that is dependent on final chemistry uh, and battery supplier. So I've touched on that the battery chemistry will be decided uh, during the tender stage, but we are investigating all the different types available, mainly LFP, which is, which is lithium iron phosphate, uh, which is what we have on our current hybrid vessels, um, LTO, lithium titrate oxide, and then probably the most popular in the market these days, which is NMC, nickel manganese cobalt. To focus on the propulsor type, so we provided some, some information on this previously, but just to give you a bit further in depth look. So our pr proposal is to have four propulsors rather than the conventional two that we have on not just the hybrid vessels. We do show the diagram there of the hybrid vessels, but that is the arrangement we normally have on our existing small vessel fleet where we have two propulsors and they're asymmetrical. Now this works absolutely fine for the existing vessels, but one area where it could improve is the course keeping ability of the vessel. So having four propulsors um, a bit more evenly split means that the course keeping should improve on the vessel. This will also provide added redundancy in the event that one propulsor was lost. Instead of just having one out of two available, you have three out of four available, so uh, an improvement in redundancy. So we are investigating different propulsor types and we've yet to make a decision on what the final propulsor type will be. And this will again likely be done during the procurement phase. But we have investigated mainly azimuth and cycloidal propulsors. Um, both of these options, they offer high levels of maneuverability, um, high levels of reverse thrust, and one of the most important things, a low response time from a head to full astern. And as you can appreciate, these vessels have to operate very quickly and get away from the slipways and lots of conditions. The images down the bottom left, you can see there's just some examples that we have on, on the existing fleet. So the far left is a cycloidal propeller unit, which is the most common within our uh, small vessel fleet. But we do have some examples of azimuth thrusters, which is a centre image and the right image. Um, the, the middle one being VEF and the one on the right being Chattel, just the makers of those propulsors. Now to talk about the station holding and the windage. So both of these propulsor types um, that we're investigating will offer high levels of station holding. And if I take you over to the table down to the bottom uh, row, um, on the hybrid vessels, this is approximately 41 knots. Uh, 
with the cycloidal uh, propulsors that are on there. Um, and depending on the final uh, propulsor choice for our vessels, this would be uh, similar, so it'd be comparable around about 40 to 44 knots, depending on final choice. Um, despite the, these new vessels being longer, they actually are very comparable, um, almost approximately the same uh, with the existing hybrid vessels. So you can see the diagram down below. So this in the green image is the new vessel uh, side profile uh, against the existing hybrid vessels. So the Halig, the Katrina and the Lock and Var. Uh, and it shows you the comparison between the two. So although longer, the windage is comparable, but probably more importantly is the windage is lower down. Uh, as you can see, the wheelhouse is sitting slightly lower. Um, this still provides the line of sights that we need to provide for the crew to meet all the rules and regulations. Um, but because we've got the passenger accommodation and the crew accommodation down on the vehicle deck, um, this means we don't have the wheelhouse sitting as high uh, over, over the vehicle deck. So it does reduce the windage in that aspect. Um, you can also see there just the comparison of the main particulars between the hybrids and obviously similar propulsion powers. Um, what I should say, this windage calculation doesn't include things like the ramps, any uh, vehicles that might be such as HGVs, um, which are obviously quite high sided, and also doesn't include any navigate, navigation equipment such as the masts that sit on top of the wheelhouse. So to give you an update on the comparison of the design variants, so really focusing here on the design A and the design B max, so you can see here they are the same hull form, same length, same beam, and obviously same draft, which you can't see here. Um, where they differentiate is the superstructure arrangement, so the area for the passengers and the crew. So if we start with design A, there is space for three car lanes. Um, on design B max, there is space for two car lanes. And then you can see the difference between the passenger accommodations, which we'll come on to in a little second. Um, you may remember from the previous webinar that we did have a hatched area going across the centre of the ship, which was the proposal for evacuating. This has now been updated following some engagement with MCA and it's now two hatched areas, one forward, which you can see in the yellow hatched area and one aft. This slightly reduces the capacity of design A down to 24. However, still sufficient um, for the forecast demand calculations that have been carried out. Um, I will come back to this in a second. I've got some fuller images of both passenger layouts and uh, the vehicle deck. So first of all, concentrating on the passenger areas. So as we've said, design A would be 150, design B max 250. Um, the split of internal seats to external seats. Sorry, that should say external seats on Sunday, not internal. Uh, so there's approximately 72 uh, on design A with 78 external seats. Some of these will be under cover, uh, but still external. Design B max with 121 internal seats and then 129 external. The number of toilets slightly differs just because we've got a higher passenger number on Design B max, therefore we require more toilets, but there is an accessible toilet eh, on both vessels. The crew area, um, it maybe slightly looks bigger on Design B max, but I can assure you it is the same footprint. It's just arranged slightly different because of the wider accommodation block. Um, there was a comment received last time about having a curtained off area. It's maybe very hard to see, but there is a curtained area added in here where a section can be curtained off in the event that there's maybe any passenger, passengers that are travelling that are unwell. Um, on the top images, we can see the difference between the, the section views of Design A and Design B Max. So um, Design A on the left showing the free car lanes. Um, if you look to the right hand side of that image, you'll see the passenger layout with the external sun deck above. So this would be open and then the wheelhouse above that. Um, and then similar idea for Design B Max, however, wider accommodation block. Um, as we presented the last time, the, the concept is to have all of the accommodation over to the, the starboard side of the vessel and the port side is minimal, just using space for services and access for mooring and stuff like that for the crew. Um, we touched on it in the previous webinar, but just to, to go over it again, we do have this hatched walkway you can see, which is the kind of pebble dash uh, on both designs. This is a, a pavement that's raised from the car deck uh, and will have ramp access up onto it, and it's wide enough for a, a wheelchair user. Um, and this will go all the way from the forward ramp right through to the aft ramp for both vessel designs. Um, so there is a segregated passenger walkway here, whereas in a lot of our existing small vessels, 
um, you're straight off the car deck and, and into the lounges, which is quite tight. So this gives a bit more space there as well. Now concentrating on the vehicle deck. So we've already touched on the different car capacities for design A and design B, and that means that we have three car lanes for design A and two for design B max. Um, for HGVs, there will be space for two um, on design A and one on design B. Um, that this is mainly for design B max, just to the lower uh, dead weight requirements there. We do have space for one dangerous goods as we do on uh, the existing vessel fleet. Uh, and as you can see, that has been marked on the drawing uh, with the black uh, box. For dead weight for design A, um, we have a dead weight approximate figure just now of 140 tonnes. Please note this is still in development um, and a cargo dead weight of 119 tonnes. And then for design B max, this would be approximately 96 tonnes. And then a cargo dead weight of 75 tonnes. OK, and sorry, just I'm going to jump back slightly and um, just to go back to the passengers, I did forget to mention that, as you'll see on both images, we do have bike storage. Uh, this was presented on the previous layout as actual dedicated stores. However, this will just be an open area that is covered from the top by the moving decks. Uh, so space on both designs forward and aft for bike storage. We had some questions on the last webinar about vessel ramps and particularly about operation times. So we've added some information on here. Please do note that this is still in development and will be until um, we're kind of sitting down with a shipyard and uh, a Roro equipment maker. So the, the, we have the bound steering ramps, which will be identical, as is common with our small vessel fleet, um, and they are based upon the ramps that we have on the hybrid vessels. So you can see the image of Lock and Var on the top right. Um, so the planned operation times of the ramps will be 60 seconds, so this is from the complete closed position down to uh, the slipway uh, and then 60 seconds when lifting up from the slipway to the closed position. So that is uh, what we are trying to achieve here and that is our goal. But again, as dependent on the final design. Uh, as I've touched on, um, the passenger walkway will continue onto the ramps, um, providing us a, a marked area for passenger access and egress. Uh, and the clear driving width on the ramp of both vessel designs will be a minimum of 4.2 metres. Now to just give you an update. So first time we've showed a profile of the vessel. So here we have a profile uh, of the starboard side of the vessel where the passenger and uh, crew area is located um, and the sun deck on top. Um, all still work in progress uh, just because the, the green lines are on there at the moment doesn't mean that it will end up in the final final design, but this is our kind of current thinking. And also to go alongside that is a preliminary 3D render of the vessel. Now, obviously, as you can see, it's very early days and it's just uh, our kind of thinking, obviously in a very much construction phase. Um, so we, we will be able to provide some further information on that with some more colours and further details, etc. on this. OK, so Moving on from the vessel design and now into an update on the deployment plan. So this slide here is basically what we presented at the webinar in August. So this is not the current planning. This was what we had previously. Um, so we didn't have a deployment plan as such, but we did have a list of in scope routes for the first phase of this program. So we had nine routes in total, which were Lars Cumbry, Colin Trevor Bodock, Sconzo Rassi, Locallan Fishnish, Tainlow and Gear, Iona Finnefort, Tobamori Cohoen, Port of Addy, Tabert Lock Fine, and Barra Eriski. Now, as you will see from that, you've got the corresponding existing vessel that's currently operating there. Along, please note for Largs Cumbria, that is the secondary vessel, not the, not the primary vessel, as it's lock ridden that's within scope here. Uh, you've also got the classification for each route there. Uh, with UK categorised being the, the least stringent, down to Euro B being the most stringent. And then the deployment plan options that we presented. So we had three different options. At the time of presenting this, we didn't have a preferred option. We were still working that out, but this is what we're looking at. So deployment plan option one was based upon the capacities uh, that were derived from forecast demand. So this is where we were looking for a design A to go and a design B to go. Deployment plan option two was to provide a design A, so the biggest design, 
everywhere, which would provide complete standardisation. Um, the downside of this would be that there would be an overcapacity for some areas. So because of that, uh, with one route in particular, not really needing as many cars, um, we had deployment plan option three, which was a design A for everywhere. Um, however, for Iona Finifort to receive a design B. Now that is the design B with 150 passengers, um, but we will give an update here. Um, just the notes that went along with that. Um, now I'm got, apologies, we don't have the time to go through everyone in detail, but please do refer to the previous webinar for details on the first three bullet points. But Clonic Granza was taken out of scope from the programme, so that's from both phase one and phase two, and you can find the details on the previous webinar. Um, Oban Lismore had been moved into phase two. However, looking at different options that there may be a potential interim option to replace the log striven in the uh, interim. And then Malig Armadale also been moved to phase two. Uh, again, please refer to the previous webinar. Um, Barra Eriski was obviously included in scope but and was being investigated as a part of phase one, but we did always make it clear that there was the possibility that it would be moved to phase two alongside Bernard Leverborough. And Bernard Leverborough has always been in our planning for phase two. Um, at this stage, we hadn't made any decisions on the preferred deployment plan, as I said, nor the order of deployment and not the cascading and disposing of the existing vessels. And we'll now move on to where we are now looking at for the deployment plan today. So, following the kind of development of the vessel concept design and also the port enabling works that are required, we now have the following provisional deployment plan. So I really want to emphasise that it is provisional. It is our current thinking for the seven vessels, um, but we still, this still could change just when we start to work out port works, etc. Um, so this is a provisional order of deployment. So for new vessel one, we have Colin Trive Robotic, new vessel two, Sconza Rassi, new vessel three, Iona Finifert, new vessel four, Tarbert Lachfine Portavadi, Number five, Loch Allen Fishnish. Number six, Toba Morico Hohen. And number seven, Tain Loan and Gear. But with a number eight route, Largs Cumbria to remain in scope. And we'll come on to that in the next slide to talk more about Largs Cumbria. With the three deployment plan options, um, same as on the previous slide, except we've updated number three. So deployment plan option one was the same as previous. Deployment plan option two was the same, provide a design A everywhere. And then deployment plan option three was the mixture of A's and B's, um, but this time replacing B with B max. Now, we did originally only have the design B max for Iona Finifort. However, given that it will be the same hull form, um, to make sure that we have the, uh, a redundancy of a vessel with the same passenger capacity, we do feel that it makes sense to build two of these vessels. Um, so we have got that against Toba Mori Cohen. Now, Toba Mori uh, doesn't need 250 passengers for if you're looking at the forecast demand, but we have placed it there just now based upon the fact that it can be interchangeable with Iona Finifert very commonly, and also the fact that both of these routes have the Euro B nature uh, within them. So not to be confused with Design B, but they both have that. We've yet to make any decisions on the cascading and disposing of vessels, and we will be looking to provide some more information on that in the near future. Um, but one vessel that we are looking at cascading that we have a proposal for is Halig, which I'm just going to talk about on the next slide. So this brings me to talk about Largs Cumbry. So for Largs Cumbry, um, we did touch on this previously. It is our preference to cascade an existing vessel here to replace the lock ridden uh, for the summer timetable. And this is the reason being that this is a summer time timetable only, um, which is why it's our preference for an existing vessel. And this would be with the current planning when new vessel two enters into service on the Sconza Rassi route. So Halig would be operated alongside Loch Shira in the summer and then would become a relief vessel in the winter. However, what we plan to do is to accommodate Largs Cumbria with the port enabling works, which is mainly just shore power for Largs Cumbria, um, so that it is also equipped to take a new vessel design. Now, we have obviously had the questions about the 150 passenger capacity on the new vessel, and that problem doesn't go away with the Halig because the Halig has the same passenger capacity as the new designs, um, or design I should say. 
So what we're planning to do to account for this, um, we're investigating a way of increasing the passenger capacity on Halig from 150 to a minimum of 230. Now, if we can get more than 230, we will do, but 230 is a minimum, and I'll explain why if you look at the table. So this table compares design A along with Halig and also the lock ridden, which is the vessel being replaced. Lock ridden has a passenger capacity of 200, but can only take 10 cars. So if you do the calculations, assuming two and a half passengers per car, which is commonly used, then you would have 25 car, uh, passengers in cars and 175 foot passengers currently on lock ridden. Um, so what we would propose to do is if the passenger capacity was 230, you would then have 55 car passengers and that would give you enough for 175 foot passengers. So we would have the same number of foot passengers as we currently do on the lock ridden. So car passengers increase, foot passengers would stay the same. Now, of course, if we can make it more than 230, that number will obviously increase, um, but we can't go any more than 250. 250 for these small vessels is the limit. Um, this is possible for this one route, um, because of the route classification, so because it is UK categorised waters, this is not possible for a place like Iona Finnefort because of the Euro B nature of that route. Um, so that's our proposal for Lars Cymru and we will be able to share further details uh, in due course for that one. That just gives us a slight update to give on phase two. Now phase two work has not started yet, but we are looking to start this in uh, later in the year. Um, so we now have four routes in scope for phase two. We have Barra Eriski, which is a Euro B route, Berner Leverbra, which is also Euro B, Malig Armadale, which is Euro C and slightly different from the rest, where there is link spans instead of slipways, uh, and then Open Lismore. Um, and as touched on, please refer to the previous webinar for the details on why that's been moved to phase two. Um, the Lock Striven uh, obviously is one of the older vessels in the fleet, and we are aware of that, so there will be potential interim options looked into and we'll be able to communicate that at a later date. OK, and just to finish off before we go into the kind of planning dates, uh, uh, just an update on the shore power works and the port enabling works that would be required for these new vessels. So shore power is going to be essential for these vessels. Um, we need the shore power to charge the vessels overnight, uh, so to charge the batteries. Um, and this allows zero emission operation during, during the day. And as I've said before, that will be for the full timetable in all locations. What we will look to do is to provide a shore charging device. Now, this is just some examples on the right hand side um, from Zynus and Cavotech. The Zynus one very commonly used in Norway with the electric vessels that are in operation there. Um, not to say that these will be the final devices that are installed, but just something we're investigating at the moment. And we'll look to put a device at each overnight berth, which is Colin Drive, Rassi, Finnefort, Talbot Lockfine, Lacallan, Tobermory, Kia, and as I mentioned, Largs, because that would stay in scope. And as we touched on before, eh, a shore supply of 1,000 amps would be provided, um, which is eh, 720 kVA, if you're looking at it that way. Uh, for the port enabling works, so we did touch on this last time that dredging is essential. So we do have an increased draft in this vessel compared to the existing boats. That allows us a bit more displacement. It improves the hull form efficiency um, and it reduces the battery capacity on board, but also allows us to carry batteries because they, they do weigh uh, quite a bit. Um, so the dredging would be required at five out of the 16 in scope phase one ports. And these are Colin Drive, Port of Addy, Kilhoen, Tain Loan and Gear. Um, we then do have some other works which are more recommendations. So um, we will be investigating these further, uh, whether, and these will be taken on a port by port basis. But these include things like aligning structures, uh, slipway widening and lengthening, uh, overnight berth refurbishment, and some upgrades there, including upgrades to bollards, crew gangways, these types of things, shore winches and then maybe any potential fendering upgrades uh, to the any aligning structures and overnight berths. Um, so many of these are current issues that are currently existing with the small vessel fleet we have at the moment. A good example is down in the, the bottom image there, we have the lock and var at Fishness, so there's currently no aligning structure there. Um, so the vessel is still capable of operating there, 
but if they were in a line structure, it would improve resilience of the route, uh, not just for the new vessel, but also for the existing vessels that are there. Um, so these will all be taken and then uh, reviewed on a case by case basis. We will be putting together as part of the options development stages, we call it, uh, and the port, the port design. Um, we'll put together a programme and any disruption, particularly for dredging, uh, if there's any disruption from that, and that will be shared with, with stakeholders for the uh, relevant routes uh, in due course. We did touch on this briefly last time, I just want to kind of reiterate it again. There are a number of independent port projects ongoing. Um, they're not a direct result of this small vessel replacement programme, but it's just to make you aware that we, we do keep uh, in touch with everything else that is going on. Um, so some of the, the works that are going on at the moment, there is improvements being looked at to the traffic management, so marshalling areas. Uh, this is network wide and it's for both CML ports and third party ports. Um, we have the Cumbria slipway replacement, which is ongoing, and that is a CML project. And there's a couple of port redevelopment projects that are on the go. Our Ion and Finifort, you'll probably be aware, it's quite advanced and just at very early stages of Tain loaning gear port redevelopment. So this is all uh, taken into account for the small vessel replacement programme. Uh, we are in constant engagement with our Gillen Butte Council and, and a number of other third parties uh, to make sure that it's all aligned. OK, and just to finish off before we move on to uh, time for Q&A, um, it's just about the way forward and the next steps for the programme. And this is mainly focusing on phase one. So the planning dates that we have, so we, we have the webinar tonight and over the course of the next days, I'm pretty sure we'll receive some more questions into our mailbox as we've done the last time. So we're still receiving questions maybe up until a week, two weeks after the webinar. This means that it will take us about three to four weeks to produce the Q&A document. We want to include as many questions and answers as possible. Um, so we will look to publish this towards the end of February, start of March. As Jim had said at the beginning, we are planning to carry out face to face public engagement. And um, this will be carried out on a route by route basis and will likely take place in the order that I showed uh, at the beginning there. Um, and we're looking to do that in Q2. So as soon as we have dates kind of fixed for that, we'll communicate out to, uh, to everyone. So please do check our project page because there will be some updates on there. Um, we are looking then at a procurement commencement in Q2, so dates are still unknown at the moment, but that is our current planning. That would then take us to a point in a shipyard towards the end of the year, but potentially drifting into the start of next year. Um, as we said the last time, we are still assuming a 24 month contract period, so that's design and build for vessel number one. So that would take us to Q4 2025. Uh, and again, maybe depending on when a uh, contract is awarded, it might just drift in to Q1 2026. For vessels two to seven, we look to deliver these at four to six month intervals. So probably for the first three to four vessels, these will likely be at six month intervals. And then as we get to the latter ones, it would be probably four month intervals. Um, for the port and even works, we will look to do this on a port by port basis. Um, but of course, the, the goal would be to have all of this complete before the vessels are, are in service. That would take us to a phase one completion uh, in 2028 for uh, vessel number seven being delivered on that point. Um, we don't have any planning dates at the moment for phase two. As I said, we are looking to start that work uh, at, at some point this year. Um, so we will share these in due course. Um, so thank you very much everyone for listening. Uh, that has been the, the, the webinar number two. We're now happy to take any questions during the Q&A session. Uh, just what we'll do, we'll leave this on the screen here. Um, if you've got any further questions or feedback, please type them into the chat box. Um, we'll do our best to get through as many of the questions as possible. But please be aware if it's not answered, it won't be forgotten about. It will be answered in our Q&A document, uh, which you can find in the link shown on the screen. And then if you leave the webinar and you think, oh, I really wanted to ask that question, please do email us at svrp at cmassets.co.uk. If we don't respond immediately, just please be aware that we might be receiving a high volume of questions. So we will try to get back as quick as possible. But thank you very much again for listening and for your questions in advance. Uh, we really appreciate your time for joining the webinar tonight. And we look forward to seeing you at future events, which we are very much hopeful that these will be face to face rather than over the screen. So thank you very much.
Thanks very much, Lewis. Uh, lots of detail there. Um, <clears throat> my name is uh, Brian Fulton, Head of Business Support with CMAL. And for the Q&A session, um, we've got lots of very, very good questions coming in. Lots of detailed questions as well. I'm going to try and get through as many of them as possible. We have until eight o'clock. That's 45 minutes. It seems like quite a long time. However, we ran out of time the last time. So rather than me rabbit on, I'll get into the questions. Uh, but please do keep them coming in. Anything that doesn't get answered tonight will go to the Q&A document, as Lewis has said, and uh, it will be answered. So anything that isn't answered on the night will be answered. OK, so first question uh, to kick it off. Why is it not in your scope to improve weather resilience, given that there are more windy but not extreme days, which risk further increased disruption to communities with the impact of global warming and more windy days over the next 30 years? If no consideration is given on weather resilience, there is no mention of improving weather resilience in your scope slide. So I'm probably going to throw it straight back to yourself, uh, Lewis, um, having just done that wonderful presentation. If you could um, answer yeah. on resilience, please. No problem. I can I can start that off. That's fine. Uh, so weather resilience, yeah, it's, it's probably not spelled out there, but it is certainly being considered as part of this. So I did touch on for the port works, we are looking at aligning structures in some areas where they aren't currently included. That would obviously improve resilience, particularly um, in a number of conditions, particularly in windy days. In terms of the actual vessel design itself, we are doing everything we can. So as we, we touched on there, obviously looking at the windage of the vessel, we have tried to, re to reduce it as much as possible. Obviously, we're still trying to meet the carrying capacities of the vessel. Um, so we have tried to reduce that as much as we possibly can. In terms of the propulsion, um, there's probably not much else we can improve, I would say, in, in terms of the, the station holding capability. Um, if we're able to achieve 44 knots, as we were showing there for the, the station holding, that is quite an achievement um, and it probably would be unlikely to be too much more. So it certainly, maybe not spelled out there, but it is being considered. That's excellent. Thanks, Lewis. Now, the next question is a relatively easy question, so I'll take that one. Will the PowerPoint be available on the website after the presentation? And the answer is yes, it will probably be on tomorrow, as will the recording, the recording of, of this evening's uh, webinar. OK, next question. Most large infrastructure projects that have multiple possible design solutions would use a design competition to find the optimum solution. And we have an example. Fixed links where cable stay bridge designs from one architect might be compared with tunnel options from another and a suspension bridge for a third. So can you explain the benefits of your process whereby there has been no design competition, but instead you have limited the creative design input to just one designer. That's maybe one for yourself, Jim. OK, thanks, Brian, and uh, thanks for the question. Uh, what we do here is, is part, part of the process when, when we start to look at the, the requirements for the vessel, the service needs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yes, we do engage with a single naval architect when it comes to vessel design, uh, but we basically start off looking at all the options. We'll look at you know, model hulls, we'll look at catamaran options, uh, which we have done for the small vessel replacement programme and the results of the CFD analysis that we carried out along with the, the naval architects really led us to, the, to the, the conclusion that the catamaran in this case wouldn't be as competitive as the as as the monohull. So that work has been carried out and that's taken into consideration, you know, the design speed requirements, deck space, you know, um, so on and so on and so on. So so that evaluation is carried out. But yes, it is with a, it's with a single uh, experienced naval architect consultant. OK, thank you, Jim. Um, now you'd mentioned, Lewis, that there's four prop units uh, on, on the new vessels and the new vessel design. Will the vessel continue in service if it loses one of the four prop units? Yep, so I can answer that to start with. I'm not sure if maybe someone from Calmac wants to come in after me, but so, so the idea of going for the four, like I said, is to have a bit more redundancy. Um, the vessel would be able to be capable of still running. It would be totally up to the, of course, the operator whether it would keep running the timetable that day. Um, I think that would be a decision that would probably be made in service, but it certainly has the capability of, of still running uh, when losing one of the repulsors. I'm not sure um, anyone, Phil, from 
or Graham from Carmack, if there's anything to add to that. Yep. Thanks, uh, Lewis. Yep, happy to happy to pick up on that one as well from a Carmack perspective. So you're absolutely right. You know, it, it, it does increase uh, the, the ability to do that. And I guess it would be a, ser a ser in service decision that would be, need, be made. So an assessment would be made on a case by case basis on that, taking into account a variety of other conditions um, that were prevailing at that particular point in time. But ultimately, it would be the, the captain's uh, decision in that case as to whether or not the service was able to continue. Uh, so it would be in a case by case basis. But certainly with having the four propulsors, it, it does increase that resilience for us. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Phil, and thanks, Lewis. Um, what will be the extended capacity on uh, DG? So that'll be the diesel generator uh, from the fuel tank's point of view. Uh, one day of operations running on diesel generator in case the batteries will not be charged overnight. So essentially, if there's no charging overnight, how long will the diesel generators last for? Yeah, I can answer that, Brian. Thank you. So I probably should have touched this. I didn't probably make it. Um, should have maybe put a diagram in. Maybe we can do that for a future engagement event. So the intention would be here if the crew turn up in the morning and the batteries haven't charged, then the, we would start the generator. Now the crew are normally on site uh, before the timetable starts, maybe a half an hour, 45 minutes before. So we have worked it out for every single route that if we start the generator 30 minutes before the timetable, then and run the generator during the course of the timetable, we will have enough battery capacity to last through the day. So the generator will actually charge the batteries and the vessel will still operate on the batteries, but having a generator run at the same time. And from that, we would be able to um, last the full timetable for every route that was in scope on that list. Um, for, for the extension, again, it would just be a case of we can run the generator uh, to extend the range for going the longer distances, um, but it wouldn't have to last the, the full day at all points there. It would just be run as a kind of hybrid. Super, thanks for that, Lewis. OK, the next uh, question is quite lengthy. I will read it out. I don't think we can provide an answer for it because it's really a question for Island Council who aren't on the call tonight, but we will certainly put this question to them and there will be a response to it on, on the website in the Q&A document. But the question is, service requirement for the Corrin Narrows route is unlike anything else in the CalMac network. This is particularly pertinent when considering energy storage requirements, international comparison of zero emission ferries for this type of very short high frequency service suggests that a cable ferry with an electric underwater umbilical taking power directly from the shore is the optimum solution. It removes the need for expensive batteries together with their weight and displacement penalties. Cables might also provide better resilience to the fast tidal flow there. The cable can be dropped to the seabed to allow the passage of other vessels. Why, therefore, is it best to deploy a vessel type suited to inter-island use with hugely expensive and costly batteries on such a short crossing? So that's an excellent question. Um, but as I say, I don't think we've got an answer to that with the panel that we've got this evening, but we will get an answer for that and put it into the Q&A document. So thank you for that. Uh, next question, will the ramps be wide enough for a pedestrian walkway as well as space to unload vehicles at the same time. The current hybrids operate without the walkway barriers as it may be perceived it may be difficult to safely unload large vehicles with them in place. So I think for the new vessels, maybe one for yourself, Lewis. Yeah, can answer that, no problem. Thank um, you. So no, good question. Um, for most routes, simultaneous operations don't don't normally occur for vehicles and passengers. Now that obviously can change. So the plan would be for design A, um, there is a bit more width on the ramp just because we don't have as large superstructure. So the, there would be space for the passenger walkway plus the clear width that I'd mentioned. I think it was 4.2. So you would have that plus the passenger walkway. For design B, because there is more superstructure, which is obviously taking up about the width, um, the passenger walkway is included uh, in, in the clear width there. Um, but it would still be substantial, I think probably around about uh, around about 3.5, but we can come back with an exact figure on that. Um, so that would be the plan. Thanks, Lewis. And given the high priority for resilience and interchangeability of vessels, why has a vessel type been chosen, deep drafted monohull, that is not capable of deployment on the Sound of Harris service? Uh, it's going to be Jim or Lewis, I think. Jim, I'm happy. Hi, you go for it, Jim. 
I can take that. Yes, it's going back to that earlier question as well that was raised, Brian. Really, when when we look to that, there are limitations on the sound of Harris route, as we know, when it comes to 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 draft and and water depth. Uh, but we have carried out the studies looking at the CFD analysis of both the mono hull and the and the catamaran, and the the mono the, the catamaran was proven not to be as competitive for our our requirements. So hence. Um, it, it was impossible to actually come up with a solution that could also include uh, the Sound of Harris route. That's super. That's for uh, phase two, I believe, Jim. Yes, yes, phase two. Phase two. Thank you. Um, next question. When will the invitation to tender be announced? We don't. I can take that, Brian. Thanks, Jim. As yet, we don't have a we don't have a planning date for that. I don't think I'm on camera yet, no, I'm on now. Um, so we don't have a, a planning date. And as soon as we have got a planning date, hopefully when we actually come out and uh, have these consultations face to face, we should have more of an update on the planning dates for the procurement phase. Thanks, Jim. And I think this one will probably be for yourself as well. The experience of the hybrid vessels shows that despite being hybrids, their heavy weight and lack of in-service charging has resulted in higher fuel consumption than conventionally powered vessels of the same capacity. What confidence can we have, therefore, that these heavy deep displacement vessels with no in-service charging will demonstrate their promised carbon emission savings in actual service? OK. Um... I wouldn't consider myself to be heavy displacement and, and deep vessels by any means. It's all it's all pretty relative what we're talking about here. Um, so we've got lots of data from the, the hybrid ferries which have been in you know in service. The Halley will be well, 10 years come come October this year. Uh, so there's lots of monitoring. We know the type of energy, the fuel burn on each of these vessels. We've carried out extensive studies looking at the, the new hull forums. So we have the data for the energy requirements that, are, that these types of vessels will need. So that the battery capacity that's been sized so far, as Lewis uh, touched on in the slide earlier on, was looking at five megawatt hours. That's the figure we're, we're basing it on at, at the moment. And the five megawatt hours is, is, is plenty capacity for the generation of the ship to operate all day long. Plus, we do have the benefit of having this additional backup generator as well, if that's needed. So a lot, a lot of work has been done over the last two years looking, looking at all of this in the analysis. Thanks, Jim. Um, maybe one for yourself, Lewis, now in the locked and vegan for Largs Cumbria. For Largs Cumbria, why not modify the ramps on the locked and vegan to be suitable for the route? Uh, if it will no longer be required at Colin Drive, as it is more suitable passenger and vehicle capacity for the Largs Cumbria route. Yeah, I can answer that. Thank you. So, no, it's a really good question, and it is something that will be thought about. The, I suppose the biggest reason that we're looking at an alternative option in terms of the Halig is because the Halig is only 10 years old currently, whereas the, the Dunvegan uh, is beyond 30 years now. So, by the time we do get to kind of 2025, 2026, when we start to replace these vessels, uh, we're, we're well into the kind of beyond the operational life uh, expectation of these vessels. So, like I said, no decisions have been made. Um, I wouldn't say the Halleck decision is, is made or concrete. It's just a proposal at the moment. Um, but between ourselves and CalMAC, we will look at all the options that are available. Um, and obviously, we take into consideration the conditions of vessel, the age of the vessels, just because some of the vessels are older doesn't necessarily mean that they are uh, the vessels in the worst condition. Um, so that all gets taken into account. Uh, for the, the whole deployment plan. Um, Phil, I'm not sure if maybe CalMAC have anything to add on cascading of vessels. Yep. Um, so thanks, thanks, Lewis, and, and thanks for the question. There's probably not too much, probably not too much to add to that. Uh, to be honest, as, as Lewis says, there's there's obviously other factors in the equation here. The age of the vessel, the desire for reduced uh, emissions as well would would be another piece there, and um, which would feature in uh, into that equation. But as Lewis says, the the final decision around some of this has not been made yet, and we are still working uh, through uh, deployment options uh, to get a suitable solution um, that would suit that secondary vessel at Larks. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Lewis. Um, lots of great questions coming in, so thank you. Keep them coming. We've got plenty of time. Um, can you please provide for public information the ratio between thruster output and side windage for each of the loch class vessels? Now, I'm assuming that's the 
current Loch class vessels. Does anybody yeah. have that information? Uh, we could, we can, we can't provide that right, right this moment in time, Brian. That would uh, be a piece of work to be done. But yeah, yep. it is possible to provide that information. Okay, so so we'll commit to providing that. Uh, thank you. Uh, speaking from Mull, uh, why were local communities and representative groups not directly contacted to be told about this webinar rather than relying on us having noticed the event on your website? Lewis, do you want me yeah, to say that? Yeah, well, you yeah, take that one. Okay. Yeah, take that. So we have. Oh, sorry. I don't think I'm live. Yeah, that's me. And um, so we have obviously presented it as much as we can in terms of uh, putting it on our website, getting out into local news, social media. The reason that we've been doing these webinars and it's more general is because we have been covering the full network, not just particular routes. The intention is now that we have a kind of deployment plan in place, we carry out the next stage of face to face engagement and these will be dedicated for the routes. So we will be in touch with local communities of those routes uh, to provide updates on that. Um, but we have advertised as much as we possibly can with this to get it on the website, like I say, out to social media and local news. Thanks, Lewis. And I've just taken a note as well to add uh, all ferry com committees and I guess community councils to future uh, invitations and future uh, advertising of these. Yeah. Uh, and obviously we'd appreciate if they could uh, spread them far and wide as well. So thank you for the question. Um, is nine knots a realistic service speed? Yeah, I, I can Thanks, answer, Lewis. answer that. Yes, um, of course, we are looking not just at one route here. So nine knots is the kind of common service speed with it, with throughout the small vessel fleet um, and it is realistic um, for, for all the routes. OK, thank you. Um, and when will the concept design be available? Jim, you I, one? I can take that one. Uh, Thanks, Jim. I'm not quite sure, sure of the question about when it will be available, the concept design. Um, but we can possibly, possibly to be shared uh, externally, I guess. Um, um, well, w once we're at the stage, we've got a we've got a final GA. Then we'll at the next presentations we can we can um, present more on on where we're at. Right, and do we have a, a time scale on next presentations? I guess is the um, is the question. Early, I'll give a give an indication. Early part of Q two, Brian. Uh, we're now just into February, but um, early part of Q two is what we're what, what we're thinking about. Okay, thank you. So I think we can say early early part of Q two for the answer to that. Thank you. Uh, the procurement timeline seems to fit perfectly with the availability of yard space at Ferguson's. Have, have the government made a decision yet about direct award of this contract to FMEL? Maybe one for yourself, Jim. There's been, been no decisions at all made about the procurement process uh, in Brian. We're still in the, the stage here of concept design and consultation and that, that will follow, but there's been no decisions made uh, about the procurement process for the new vessels. OK, thank you. Uh, the next one is actually got three questions in one. Um, I'll just go through them one at a time. Uh, so could you disclose the likely budget? Start with that one. Well, if you look on our three year plan, we always put aside what is the budget for for the vessels and, and the budget obviously includes the, you know, the cost of the ships and various associated um, project costs. So it, it's there and if you if you direct yourself to the CML three year plan, you'll see the budget that's been allocated for the project. OK, and second part to that is they're likely to have a social value marking component within the competitive tender. There's, there's also always an element of um, uh, what do we call it again? You you remember the term, but there's yes, there's always there's always an element of it. Yeah. Community benefits. That's it, community benefits. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> OK, and uh, question three, uh, will you appoint one or more shipyards and assumed to be regional advantage? We appoint one or more, more shipyards. Ship yard or yards. Uh, well, the intention would be that, you know, when we when we do go out to, during the procurement phase, we'll be going out for a series of vessels for, for shipyards and to bid upon, to bid for. 
OK, thanks, Jim. Um, and thanks for the questions. So for Largs Cumbria, the second vessel for the summer would be the existing hybrid vessel that would be redeployed. What about the primary vessel, Loch Shearer? Is that to be replaced by a new boat? I can answer that, Brian. Thanks, Lewis. Yeah. So we haven't uh, probably spelled out in this webinar, but in the previous webinar, we did kind of make it clear the vessels that weren't included within the scope and Loch Shearer is one of them. The Loch Shearer will remain the primary vessel for Lars Cumbria. It is, believe it or not, one of the newer small boats. It was uh, built kind of 2006, entered into service 2007. Um, so it's a lot newer compared to the boats that we're looking to replace just now with the likes of the Isla Cumbria being in 1977 and the Law class boats being in the kind of mid to late 80s. So we're, we're still a bit of time away before looking at replacements for Loch Shearer. OK, thanks, Lewis. And what were the reasons for deciding in the end to move Barra Eriski to phase two? I think it kind of was phase one, phase two, phase one, phase yeah. two, and it's currently in phase two. So what, what was the, the thinking around that? OK, so there is there is a few reasons. So first of all is age of the vessel. Again, not quite as new as Loch Shearer, but Loch, Loch Allen does have, uh, Loch Elaine, sorry, does have a bit of time in its sight compared to the vessels we're looking to replace in the first phase, being 1997. So still got a 10 year advantage over some of the boats. Um, the second is commonality with the Bernoulli Leverbrug design, um, particularly obviously looking at maybe commonality between these vessels for them to be interchangeable. Um, and the, the third reason is, is looking at capacities. So the capacities that we have for design A and B um, would, wouldn't be uh, likely sufficient for Barra Eriski. So they're probably much more in line with the capacities that are required for Bernoulli Leverbrug. So that's the, that's the reasons for phase two. Thanks, Lewis. OK, the next one. Uh, glad to see that vessels have been future proofed to comply with EU classifications. Note that Norwegian ferry company Havila uh, Christruten has banned the carrying of electric vehicles with lithium ion batteries, which they have assessed as posing a significant fire risk. This was further emphasised after the Felicity Ace cargo ship sank almost a year ago. Is this an issue? of concern for current plus new design ferries. I can take that one, Brian. Thanks, Jim. OK, no, it's uh, absolutely something we're aware of and uh, uh, we're aware of this in the marine press as well that we receive regularly uh, every day. So so at, at the moment with, with the new ferries, you know, we, we, we're looking at the provision of having char charging points, uh, but, but really the, the plugging in of, of, of the vehicles is, is with CalMAC as part of their operations. So it's something at the moment that's not done in the vessels, but it is something that's been that is being considered. And that's that's the update I've got at the moment on that. OK, thanks, Jim. Um, have you considered variable speed gen sets instead of fixed speed 50 hertz? Uh, this would further lower your, your emissions. Okay, I, I can answer that very quickly, Brian. The, Thank there's, you. The, there's no kind of um, set preference here for, for fixed speed, variable speed. We've, we've just been looking at different options at the moment. What we do know is we would like to keep the generator around about the 375 kilowatts range uh, just because of the categorization of spaces, etc. So that's the reason for that rating. Um, but we will look at various options over the next, um, the next couple of months to make sure that we've got the most efficient solution. OK, thanks, Lewis. And there's also a thank you for a, an informative presentation. Can you tell us anything about your thinking on provision for cycles on board the new vessels? That's including any non-standard cycles with different footprints like tandems, disability adapted cycles, trikes, cycle trailers, etc. Keeping cyclists away from petrol diesel fumes from vehicles on board is a key desirable characteristic on boarding and disembarking. So uh, cycles, active travel. Yeah, can do. So what we do have on here, uh, it was shown on one of the layouts, uh, but we can provide a bit more detail on that in the future. We do have some dedicated uh, bike storage space. Um, so that is, it is off the car deck. Un I mean, we, unfortunately, we do have a small vessel here where space is an absolute premium. Um, so we do have space dedicated there, which the, the other small vessels don't tend to have. Um, our original plans was for this to be a closed off store. But we just feel from a, a point of view, it would be much easier to just have it as an open space that is covered by the mooring decks above. Um, 
given that some of these routes are only 5, 10, 15 minutes long, um, we don't really want people in and out of stores and it's just easier. Uh, in terms of space for all the different uh, list of, of bikes you've mentioned, th there will be obviously the space there. Um, I can maybe put an update on the Q&A document of, of how much space will be available, uh, the kind of square meterage. OK, thank you. And were faster hull forms more power uh, considered, which might allow for improved timetables due to shorter journey times? So faster that, speed man. vessels. Thanks, Jim. That's being switched on. So no, nine knots is the surface speed of, of these vessels. They will be capable of, of operating at a higher speed uh, than, than the nine knots. Uh, what well, would be good if the, the 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 person that's asked the question, if they could give us maybe an idea more of the type of speed that they're, they're thinking about here, because uh, so far to have anything you know in the region of thirteen or fifteen knots is is certainly not being considered for these for these routes. Yeah, and possibly in relation to the specific route as well, uh, possibly one for the the island connectivity plan that's coming up in the consultation around that. If we're talking about uh, faster timetabling. Um, OK, at what stage will you be looking to interact with companies who would be interested in assisting you with the build project? Yeah, Brian, that's one for me, I think. OK, thank you. Hi, yeah, so we um, we don't have a date in mind at the moment. We have just um, completed the feasibility study and moving into options development, then detailed design, and then it will be the normal procurement route for um, construction works after that. So no date set at the moment. Excellent, thanks, Corey. OK, um, by the time you have face to face consultation with island communities, when we actually have the opportunity to have a conversation rather than watch presentation, uh, will there be anything of significance left to consult on other than perhaps the colour of the seats? Uh, so that's when we come to the the face to face consultation. What sorts of things can we expect at that point? I can yeah, take that one. Oh, there you go, Jim. No, we can OK, I'll give that one to Jim. Thank you, Jim. Uh, what we've done in these last two webinars is provide a lot of detail on, on the studies that's been that's been carried out. Um, so we welcome all the questions and, and, and all the all the input. So all I can ask is everybody that's tuning in here to to ask us all the questions that they've got, ask us well in advance. And, you know, when we come out uh, for the next face to face consultations, we can sit and keep the conversation going. Hey, thanks, Jim. And what is the expected battery service life for the proposed vessels? Has this been costed from a through life perspective and refit schedules? Yep, yeah, I can answer that. Uh, Thank you. So, so yes, this is absolutely being considered and has all been fed into the business case that we have to do for the new vessels. Um, it really depends on which battery manufacturer you speak to. Most will guarantee 10 years. Uh, some say more than that, where you're having to replace batteries. We currently have a good example just now of the three hybrid vessels. Um, so the first one, Halley, will be 10 years old this year and we'll be looking to replace the batteries uh, in due course. Um, but this is obviously the battery technology from 10 years ago. So the battery technology is always improving. Um, so, but we do have uh, 10 years as a kind of figure in our business case. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, now, there's still a lot of questions coming in and I'm hopeful that we'll get through them by eight o'clock. Do keep them coming in. Thank you. Uh, with the Halig coming to Largs Cumbria, this is a, a question about ramp speed. Will the ramps be upgraded to the same speed as the Loch Sheer is so that so that she can keep to the timetable uh, fast ramps as in summer, a hybrid ferry struggles to keep the timetable uh, or any other vessel coming to the Cumbria route for that matter? I can maybe answer the start of that question and then if, if Thank you. Cal Mac have got anything to add, I'm happy to do so. So well, first of all, just say that there's no the decisions haven't been made. So just, just in case everyone thinks that's it, the Halig's coming, it's just our, our kind of proposal or thinking at this moment in time. Um, as part of all that, we absolutely will look at how that compares with ramp speed, etc. Um, maybe Cal Mac can answer more about the timetabling part of that, if there's anything to add. 
Okay, thanks. Thanks, Lewis. There's, there's probably not too much to say on it in the moment, other than to say that, you know, we obviously will be looking at that as, as you know, if indeed uh, the plans do firm up around about that and uh, just looking at, you know, what, what might be possible there, we will absolutely be looking at, you know, what effect that has in the timetable and feeding in any impacts on that and then considering how we solve uh, any of those issues going forward. Thanks, Phil, and thanks, Lewis. Um, the next question is similar to a previous one. It's around around speeds and route timetabling, um, but specifically on some of the longer small vessel routes, increased service speed would bring significant service advantages, primarily increased frequency that not only offers more travel options, but also increases total route capacity. Why were designs that offer higher service speeds for the same power requirement not considered? One for, I guess, Jim or Lewis. I, I can take that. I mean, yeah. Thanks, Jim. I missed, I, missed, I missed the first part of that, Brian, if you want to just go over that again. Yes, yeah, certainly. So on some of the longer small vessel routes, increased service speed would bring significant service advantages, primarily increased frequency that not only offers more travel options, but also increases total route capacity. Why were designs that offer higher service speeds for the same power requirement not considered? That's something we can have a further discussion with uh, Transport Scotland uh, when it really comes to the island's connectivity plan about you know levels of service requirement. So the service requirements that we were all working to here were for a vessel that could be capable of a uh, nine knots uh, service speed. But we can we can come back on that one, Brian. Okay, thanks, Jim. Uh, will the potential restructure of CMAL and CalMac impact the potential schedule? Um, so that's really a, a question around Project Neptune, um, and I think I, I could probably answer that one and 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 just give a firm uh, no because which I guess whichever way Project Neptune um, spells out the, the the structure of the organisations, it won't impact the actual delivery. Um, I think it's safe to say. Uh, moving to the next one. Given that you have yet to carry out public consultation, will there be opportunities for communities to influence the capacity of the vessel on their route? Communities' expectations and aspirations for economic growth, including both visitor and resident expectations, may be different from the simplistic assumptions of the current usage and simplistic Transport Scotland modelling. Again, that is probably one that will fall into the island's connectivity uh, plan which is undergoing consultation at the at the moment. Uh, I don't know if Jim, you've got anything to add to that. No, no, nothing I can really add at this point, Brian, on that one. But when, uh, yeah, we're talking about the sort of policy and timetabling and any changes to the actual service there. Um, as propulsion, batteries and uh, you need to help me out with with uh, PMS are the main systems on each vessel and research already carried out. Uh, do CMAL plan to nominate a preferred turnkey supplier as part of the ITT process? I can take that, Brian. OK, thanks, Jim. Oh, somebody can switch me on. <laughs> Uh, there's part of the ITT process, there'll be a, a technical specification with um, a list of requirements to be delivered. To be delivered. Uh, there's no there's no mentions of any preferred suppliers within that documentation, so it will be based upon a statement of requirements and a technical specification. Thank you. Uh, a major problem with the hybrid vessels is insufficient cargo deadweight capacity because of their high lightship weight. Commercial traffic is regularly short shipped on the Loch Allen Fishnish route as a consequence. Will these vessels have greater capacity for HGV carryings than the hybrids? I can answer yes. that. So Thank that, you. That information was presented in the slides, but maybe not directly compared against the, the hybrid vessels. So there is an improvement uh, in deadweight, uh, particularly cargo deadweight. Um, I think we showed there 119 tonnes. If you compare that to the hybrids, it's, it's quite an increase. Um, there will be space for two HGVs on the vessel, um, which is comparable to the hybrids, but um, it would be HGVs plus, plus vehicles as well. So that, that is the plan for the new vessel. For the Design B Max, I should say that it would be one, uh, and it is slightly less uh, deadweight requirements, but for the, the route mentioned there, 
it's a design A that is proposed. Thanks, Lewis. Um, what's the expected lifespan of the Loch Shearer? And when will she be replaced? And if it's like lifespan is to be extended, will there be any upgrades done to it? For example, upgraded to a diesel electric propulsion system to make it more resilient and efficient from both operation and maintenance, from both an operations and maintenance point of view. Um, so this is, what is the lifespan? What's the, the lifespan of the, the Loch Shearer? I, Jim, you want me to answer that, you? Uh, I, I, can, I can start. So Loch Shearer was uh, delivered in 2007 that when, when I worked in the Ferguson, Ferguson shipyard. Um, so she's now, what, 16 years old? So she's still got some, some life in her. Uh, currently no plans to, to make any significant um, upgrades on, on the vessels, but it's, it's something, you know, maybe longer term that, that we will look at. Don't know if you want to add anything, Lewis? No, no. I don't. The only thing I'm going to add is that we do kind of work with the operational life expiry of being 30 years, so that is what we consider. Thank you. And on bike spaces, um, question is, will the bike space have charging sockets? I think it's, it, it intends to say um, charging sockets in the bike spaces. Um, I'm not too sure what that's intended, if that's for like electric bikes. Um, there's no current planning, but something we can take into consideration. Jim did touch on electric car charging sockets, which there is a bit of a question mark over at the moment in, in discussions with the regulatory bodies ongoing to make sure that it is actually possible to include these. So it is something that we consider, but it might be out of our hands to be able to include these. Thank you. This is one on the, the procurement process, maybe one for yourself, Jim. Uh, given that it's possible that an overseas shipyard could be a successful bidder in the procurement process, would CMAL commit to a Scottish or UK uh, or Scottish and UK procurement of key equipment and free issue to the shipyards, assuming this is co cost effective? Um, we, we would need to look at if, if that indeed is, is an option. Um, as I understand it, we can maybe get some guidance. I don't know if that's if that is an option to actually name uh, name equipment makers, uh, but it's something we could look at and look at the legalities around all of that. Uh, it would also require a, a, an overseas shipyard as well um, within the, the statement of the question. The next one just says 12 knots. I don't know if that's an answer to one of the previous questions. Uh, but I'll move to the next one. Uh, can I suggest you look at the smaller full electric ferries operated by uh, Vus traffic in Gothenburg, possibly just an upscale in design and performance, but based on a tried and tested vessel? Um, what's I, your I, thoughts I, on that? I can comment, on? Brian. OK, thank, thank you. So I can't speak specifically about those vessels, um, but we have visited a number of electric vessels around Scandinavia and other parts of Europe. So we have had discussions with various ship owners and operators, um, along with the consultants we're working with, Navalu. They're also very familiar with a lot of design. So um, you've got to bear in mind that these other vessels are being designed to, to, to sets of requirements and obviously we're designed to our own sets of requirements here. Um, but we, we do keep in touch with a lot of the other owners and operators that already have electric vessels in operation. Excellent, thank you. Um, and can you confirm what support documentation will be provided at the ITT stage, please? I can take that. Thanks, Jim. Um, so for, at the ITT stage, there will be a general arrangement drawing provided and a technical specification provided. Okay, thank you. Um, and this is one about CMAL personnel. In order to give us confidence in your professional competence, can you detail the naval architecture qualifications of the CMAL vessels team from the director of vessels down? Um, maybe not for the webinar just now, but we can certainly detail within the Q&A document further down uh, when that gets published, uh, unless anybody wants to go through their qualifications. But I don't think it's probably appropriate for the for, for the moment. <laughs> um, the vessel characteristics presented are to be considered as minimum requirements or mandatory requirements, and the bidders will have the possibility to offer alternative solutions. I, I guess that's that will, will, the, will the bidders, yep, have yep, the possibility that, that, to offer alternative solutions. Thanks, yep, Jim. Yep, we, 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 would all, we would also always allow that within the ITT for alternative uh, bids, along, along with the 
you know the the main the main requirements. Yep. So yes is the answer to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there no one here to answer policy questions from Transport Scotland? I think the answer to that is uh, we, we have no. had some connection issues, Brian. That that's the reason being, but we will be able to provide an answer to all the policy questions it, that have it, been asked. It, it is genuinely unfortunate because we did have somebody from Transport Scotland uh, lined up to come on and they have been una unable to connect quite simply. However, uh, any of the policy questions, we will get answers uh, to those in the Q&A document uh, post the meeting. Uh, so apologies for that. Um, is it not a concern that you're building vessels to define capacities without actually asking the communities what their expectations are for their usage? Uh, the communities may have different expectations from the current timetable for one capacity, two frequency and three timetables. Um, so I guess that's one for Cal Mac and one perhaps for yourself, Lewis, but it really is this kind of statement of requirements question. Um, and how we, we get those to feed into, into the process and also one for the island's connectivity plan, going back to that. Yeah, I, I can start it off, Brian, and then maybe if Cal Mac would come in on that. So, okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, as we've said before, we are designing to requirements that have been set here. Obviously, these capacities haven't just been made up. They have been worked out through all the forecast demand. appreciate that might be different opinions from, from the people uh, using the ferries, but that is where these capacities have come from. Um, and I suppose you're absolutely correct, Brian, is the Islands Connectivity Plan is the opportunity to feed into all of that. Um, I'm not sure if, any, Phil, if you've got anything else from Calmac. Yeah, I guess. Yep. Thank you uh, for that. Um, I guess I can add just a little bit uh, to that. So, you know, agreeing with what Lewis is saying there, just maybe just to give a little bit of uh, context in terms of the forecast demand that, that Calmac uh, use. Uh, so I guess, you know, that's been provided by a, an external consultant, um, Reference Economics, uh, which is a, a body that is, is approved and agreed by uh, Transport Scotland uh, to provide those forecasts. Um, they provide forecasts for, for various traffic types, as well as um, the expectation for um, passengers across each of the routes. And, and we really have that forecast out until 2041, 42 um, at the moment, um, which has given us a the, the sort of information that we're feeding into this here, but I would just echo, I suppose, what Lewis is saying around uh, Island connect Connectivity Plan, and there probably is just a little bit more comment um, that could be given by Transport Scotland later um, uh, in the Q&A document as it comes out. That's super. Thanks, Phil, and thanks, Lewis. Um, and next question, uh, has a cost comparison been made between your budget price and other recently delivered vessels? of similar capacity and propulsion type. I can answer that, Brian. Thanks, Jim. So along with our, our naval architects that are working on this with us in the value, uh, we, we look at the, the market and what the market's doing for you know similar capacity vessels with similar propulsion type and so on. So so we do know the, the current market prices for these vessels and our consultants also know the current market indicative prices for the main propulsion plant, for the batteries, for the ramps, for the navigation equipment, for the fit out of the ships. So that's all that's all data that is that is known. So so yes, it is based upon what is sort of current prices for this size and capacity of vessel. Super, thanks, Jim. Um couple more. Uh, can you explain and in capitals in detail uh, the rationale for not quick charging between service runs as is commonly done in Norway? Is it anything to do with the perceived difficulty of adapting charging equipment to a slip where the lateral position of the vessel varies with tide? Yeah, I, I can answer that. Right. Thanks, Lewis. So, yeah, um, we have looked and we've not ruled out the fact of intermittent charging. Um, obviously, the starting point is timetables. A lot of the timetables are busy that don't allow charging during the day. I appreciate in Norway, we have seen countless examples where they are charging in between stops, but that is for a, a good few minutes at a time rather than just in and out of a slipway. Um, there are a number of reasons relating to the slipway itself. You're absolutely correct. Um, the lateral position does move, which makes it extremely difficult. We have engaged with suppliers of charging devices um, that have been looking at options. 
and really for a slipway there is no easy option, um, particularly when some of these slipways don't have aligning structures, they don't have uh, a berth directly next to the slipway uh, to use. Um, so trying to have a reliable system there would be difficult. So the reason for overnight charging is we feel it would be more reliable. Um, of course, it does mean a higher bas battery capacity on the vessel, but it would be more reliable for the service. There are some examples in Norway where we've been on vessels. Uh, a recent example of a Norled vessel um, where they have around about four megawatt, just over four megawatt hours of batteries on board because like that, they don't have uh, the infrastructure available to charge off of at every stop. So they're operating the full timetable and then charging overnight. So um, it is common in Norway to do that, but there is examples where they are uh, got all the batteries in, uh, installed on board. Uh, thank you very much, Lewis. Um, finishing on a, it's just a comment, it's not a question. Calmac don't consult with communities to validate their economic predictions, which is a comment which I'm sure we'll take on board. Uh, I'm quite sure it'll be challenged and um, however, we'll take that on board and take that away. Uh, that is now eight o'clock and believe it or not, there are no more questions. Uh, we have gone through all of the questions so far. If there are any further that come in, uh, we'll add them to the Q&A document. And as you'll have seen on the screen, if you write to the, the email address on there, um, uh, which is svrp at cmassets.co.uk, uh, you will also get an answer uh, through that channel. Um, but all there is left for me to say is thank you everybody for attending. We had a good number of attendees on tonight's um, webinar. Thanks very much to all those who participated. Thanks especially to, to Lewis for the presentation and uh, to Jim for the introduction. And we'll hopefully see you all in person at the, the next round of, of, um, uh, of events for uh, the Small Vessel Replacement Programme. Thank you very much.